So I like to start off with a little bit of levity and humor and all of that because here we are with our scripture stories that have to do with this big topic, temptation, temptation. And the even bigger topic around that has to do with this other phrase that is the topic of today's sermon. In most things, what do we, what do we mean by in most things? We need to unpack that term just a little bit, separate it out from other ideas we might have in regards to what that means, especially as we're trying to get to the spiritual essence of this. Swedenborg discusses things theologically and uses this term to describe those qualities that are at the very core of our being, the depths of our being and at the very center of us spiritually. A whole lot of time and energy can be spent on not only trying to to define those qualities that are not that. And it's fair to say that in our world, we spend a whole lot of time on the periphery of all of that. And if we don't have some attention at that essence, that core, those things that are the inmost things, guess what? We're going to spend a whole lot of time and energy and consuming decades on the periphery, on those things that are not at the core of our spiritual identity. And I do know something about this because before I went into ministry, I was in the corporate world. And uh, let's see, my title was in the, uh, as a database marketing analyst in the customer information and strategic analysis department. Boy, (laughs) just trying to wrap your head around that is uh, bending. But what I learned was, you know, you can take information, you can slice it, you can dice it, and boy, you can, on a surface level, tell a whole lot about people, things like, psychographic information and propensity to buy certain products based upon age, gender, income, number of accounts and strength of relationship, your education, your home ownership, all those account balances you might have collectively. And yes, all of that remains out here. This trend is continued and even amplified 20 years later. And you may have noticed if you've been searching for something Online, guess what? Magically, that same thing that you've been searching on shows up. It's like, wow, God, magic. You knew exactly what my intention was. Not so magical. It is science, it's marketing, it's all those ways that keep our consuming economy going. The point is, ultimately, if we define ourselves out here, we forget to spend more time on the interior and the inmost things. Another way of understanding this is, sometimes it's used in psychological terms, the masks that we wear. We may be a certain way at home and then we get ready to go out in the world and we put on a certain veneer, a certain mask, whether it's the, the appearance and all the things, but it's the way we interact in society. And again, it is the periphery, the exterior stuff, and not what we're talking about here, what drives to the deeper spiritual dimension, the inmost things. So that's all good context for entering into what is discussed here in various ways, not only in the writings from Swedenborg in the Old Testament, as well as the New here. Swedenborg spends a moment or two talking about the moment of temptation and the difference we have between simply entertaining the thought, which is relatively benign. It doesn't do a whole lot. And that happens to us because we're human. We have a certain thought, a certain idea. And the difference and the reason why you're all here and not in jail is uh, hopefully you you didn't act on every thought that you have that was less than purely holy. So that's essentially what he's talking about in the different levels. We have a thought, we recognize it as a thought, and we let it go. 
But what's really being kind of teased out there in that small portion of what Swedenborg writes is the capacity to entertain something as a temptation that then we put into action in the world. And when we do that, that's taking the leap from just a thought, which we can let go of, and action in the world that does harm. So that's a big topic. It's a big discernment in our own lives, and we are talking about in most things. And as Swedenborg said in that quote, but when evil enters into the will, it does harm, for then it also goes forth into act whenever external bonds do not constrain, do not restrain. External bonds, meaning all those things that if we did it, there would be some consequence for it out in the world because that's why we have laws. Now, here's where it starts getting more interesting in the spiritual terrain, especially when we're digging deeper on the inmost things. Let's say we have a sweet tooth. Let's say we really love sugar. And let's say after every meal and before each meal, we love to have lots of amounts, of large quantities, cookies and ice cream, anything sugary. Now, here's the thing about it. We have bodies, and so pretty, pretty quickly, we're going to understand after a few days, it may not be the healthiest choice. The same is when we get to the spiritual understanding of that inmost thing. We choose something that's good, healthy, and aligned with God. Guess what? It, it feels good to do good. We naturally gravitate towards that. And you see children interacting with one another, they they have that capacity as well. So in small quantities, you know, it's good to have that, but maybe not every meal. You don't consume large amounts of it. But this translates to the spiritual qualities, especially as we're entering into digging in deeper on the Genesis story. Now, this is, I, I would be, it'd be hard pressed to talk to anyone on the planet at this point and have them not have any context or understanding for Adam and Eve. It is one of those stories that has been told for so long under such, um, you know, simplistic ways. Everyone at least understands the, the names, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden story. And the temptation of Eve to give the ap ap Adam the apple. And it's also good to understand this as a story of allegory and metaphor. It's not necessarily meant to take on the literal level. I like to say we understand it literally, not literally. It would be fantastic if the Bible was simply blasted down straight from God into one hand and like, this is it, God. It didn't happen that way. It happened over a long period of time and it happened through human devices. So we have to have discernment on simply understanding the story, how it got to be, and what does that mean in terms of our present moment? How does that story itself translate to us? You will, sh you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now think about that for just a moment. Who doesn't want to be more God-like? Everyone wants to be more like God. But this case, this is the fall from, some would say, in ignorance out of innocence and yet we're on the road to gaining more life experience and more wisdom on our own journey. And this is where I find it fascinating. Becoming like God is understanding what's good and what's evil. That's pretty simple. And that's really the continuation of what it is as, as, at its core. Um, I think it's fair to say that it can be a slippery slope in terms of the context. We have these thoughts, we don't act on them, and yet to become like God, the thing that is there as 
the Genesis story is, in, on the one hand, it's the fall, and the other, it's us becoming more advanced spiritually. We're becoming more like God because we know the difference between good and evil. So it's a paradox. We would never have grown further in our own spiritual journey if we had remained back in the garden. And that's not, that's not where it ends. It's not where, where we're trying to return to. It is a starting point. It's also tempting. There's a temptation here to go back. So let's move on to our New Testament story and New Testament scripture. And this is subtitled, Hangry is a Thing. It is. You get, uh, when you're hungry, you can get angry. And this is the first temptation of Jesus where he fasts. He goes without food. And this is, the, this is what brings on the temptation. Now, why is, why is this important for our spiritual development? Because a few things. And uh, I'm not making this stuff up. If you happen to be before a, a judge in a courtroom, or you're trying to negotiate something as a big, important business deal, make sure you do this and schedule it after lunch. Why? Why are so many business dealings during lunch? Hangry. Hangry is a real thing, and it's been studied. The science is out there. They've proved statistically that especially if you're in a courtroom and the judge is trying to decide and they are ready to get on to their lunch, the sentencing is more severe for anyone that is there right before they get a break to go to lunch. So, if you learn nothing else today, <laughs> schedule your courtroom's meetings with a judge after lunch. In most things. In the case of our scripture story, Jesus being tempted in the desert, not having food for a, an extended period of time. Of course, this is when temptation comes in. And if we're talking about in most things, it, it is that moment where there is the thought and then there is the action. Those two are commingling here. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Bless you. And Jesus responds with Scripture that we do not live by bread alone, but by the Word of God. Now, the second temptation is for Jesus to throw himself down upon the holy temple in a grandiose fashion. And this one is a little bit different in that um, we can all probably relate to this. We had the uh, various awards ceremonies and we all imagine ourselves in that moment of in glory before people and here I am and we want everyone to think well of us. But this becomes another temptation because it is that type of thing, which, again, if we're talking about the externals versus the inmost things, this is one of those that tempts the externals, and it was really a way to test what was on the interiors of Jesus in that moment. And if there was no success there, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be talking about this. There would be no New Testament. So Jesus does respond, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The third and final temptation is at the heart of our story here. The devil invites Jesus to bow down and worship him. And if he does this, he will be given power to rule the world. And this is another safe point to say, had that happened, we would also not be here talking about this reference point. 
It's also fair to say that each of us in our own journey wrestles with similar temptations on a daily basis. Things where we are able to maybe gain more in the exterior world. Those temptations. The story, not only in Genesis, the story of the temptation in the desert gets back, underscores, the inmost things within us and forging of our spiritual journey and discernment along the path of life is in those moments of trials, in those moments when we are tested. And believe me, if you haven't been tested, you will. How do we respond in those moments? What is the bedrock of our faith at the inmost of our spiritual interiors that helps us forge a path spiritually through those temptations? What is it that we rely on? The way that Jesus responds to these is one great example. They are powerful reminders of how this is not just a static process that happened then. This is an ongoing practice in our own life and lives. And the good news is that when we navigate through them successfully, it becomes easier to navigate those same similar situations in the future. And we're clearing energetically a spiritual path before us. It underscores the same path that Jesus led and we are invited to follow. At that last temptation, Jesus is clear in where he comes down on that. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. So I invite the presence of the Holy One and the Holy Spirit to fight alongside all of us in our spiritual battles. Amen.